About a year ago, I made my first video essay. In it, I talked about a new at the time reality show called Too Hot to Handle that had just been released on Netflix. I was fascinated by the show's badness and it being early quarantine, I was still getting used to everything. I said, hey, I'm gonna crank out a video essay and here I am now. Just recently, Netflix released season two of Too Hot to Handle and of course I watched it. And through watching it, I think I've actually gained some interesting new insights as to what exactly makes the show so uniquely bad. So this is that video, the long-awaited Too Hot to Handle follow-up, Too Hot to Handle. Let's do it. I feel that I should begin by paraphrasing the fourth and most important part of my previous video in which I talked about the scientific method. My argument went basically like this. Reality television is to an extent scientific. Not in any rigorous way, of course, but it does share a lot of commonalities with the scientific method. The crux of the scientific method is the testing of a hypothesis. If X, then Y. Now there's a couple of different ways to test a hypothesis, but the most relevant one for this video is this. If you want to test whether toilet paper dissolves in liquid, place toilet paper on a bunch of solids, it doesn't dissolve, then place it in a liquid, and it will dissolve. Now that's not the most rigorous proof ever, but you've essentially, to most people, basically shown that your hypothesis is true. Toilet paper dissolves in liquid. Too Hot to Handle also has a hypothesis, but instead of toilet paper probably dissolves in water, it's abstaining from sex probably leads to better romantic connections. In order to test this, the show takes a very specific kind of person, the kind of person who is both having a lot of sex and not already forming any good romantic connections. Now, the first step to any erotic conquest is to D, demonstrate your value. This is essentially the toilet paper not dissolving on the solid. It takes those people, puts them on an island, and tells them not to have sex with each other, and observes whether or not they form better romantic connections. That's all well and good until it becomes increasingly clear that Too Hot to Handle is stacking the deck, both in terms of the structure of the show itself and in the narrative they weave out of the week's worth of footage they have. The show is not a good faith attempt to find out what happens in this circumstance. It's designed to push their answer of it, specifically that they're right, that abstinence does lead to better romance. You know, Valsel shit. That's the conclusion I came to in my earlier essay. And I still agree with it, but I would like to add a little more to it. See, what I posed is that the show fails because they force-fed us an answer to their hypothesis. But what season two made me realize is that it isn't just that they cheated to get their answer, it's that their answer is wrong. So look, I'm not a psychologist or whatever. I don't know whether in the real world abstaining from sex leads to better romance. If I were to guess, I would say it probably doesn't, but that doesn't really matter. What matters is that that's not even true in the show. See, even if their hypothesis is correct that abstinence rules. Maybe you wanna have sex because hey, it's fun. You know what's not fun? STDs. The show has failed to prove it. And not just because they fudged the data, but because even their fudged data would not prove it. Spoiler warning from here on out. So let's forget about the selective narratives and posturing and corny seminars here for a second, okay? Let's pretend that scientifically speaking, the show was completely impartial and everything that the guests did was a natural consequence of them being in this environment with these rules. If the hypothesis of the show were correct, we would expect that those who abstained from sex would in fact form better, deeper romantic connections. As it turns out, that is not at all what goes down on the show. See, over the course of the show, there are four main relationships. There's Cam and Emily, Marvin and Melinda, Chase and Carly, and Nathan and Larissa. Simply put, Cam and Emily and Marvin and Melinda are the sex havers, whereas Chase and Carly and Nathan and Larissa are the vol cells. Now, if the show is right, Chase and Carly and Nathan and Larissa should have better relationships than Marvin and Melinda or Cam and Emily do. But that is not what happens. The sex havers are the only two couples to actually be officially boyfriend and girlfriend at the end of the season. And Marvin won the cash prize. Meanwhile, for the Valsells, 
Well, Chase and Carly had a bad breakup about halfway through that basically put them both in a bad mood for the rest of the season. And Nathan and Larissa had such a bad breakup that Larissa up and left right after it happened. She just dipped from the show. Most failed hypotheses fail because the scientists can't prove a correlation between their two factors. But this hypothesis fails in a much more dramatic way. There is a strong correlation between sex had and deepness of the romantic connection, but it's not in the correct direction that the show wants it to be in. The data that the show presents us with would actually suggest that sex is important for adult relationships, which, you know, it probably is. And remember that I'm not talking about the real world here, necessarily. I'm aware that Marvin ghosted Melinda right after the show and she got with Peter, whatever. The point is, in the scope of the show, they completely fail to prove their hypothesis, and the narrator still talks as if abstinence won the day. So, the moment I knew I had to make this video happened around halfway through the new season. Lana had just given one of the couples a challenge, a night in a private, beautiful, romantic suite, but of course, the rules still apply. Now, if they can't keep their hands to themselves, the entire group stands to lose money, and this couple is not exactly known for their self-control. Cam says, Marvin and Melinda are in a pickle now, because unless they show some form of genuine connection to the rest of us, none of us are going to be happy. And it's right then that everything clicked. See, while I do agree with all my points from my first video, I don't really think I struck at the core of what makes this show so bad. I think deep down I knew that even if they ditched Lana and ditched the narrator and got more likable contestants and took their hand off the scales and ditched the seminars and every other note I had, the show fundamentally would still not work. And I wasn't quite sure why that was. But when Cam said that, I think I figured it out. Reality competition typically works in one of two ways, and I'm going to call these the MasterChef model and the Survivor model. Now, in the MasterChef model, the competition is parallel, which is to say, the contestants aren't exactly battling each other so much as they are trying to do the same thing better than each other. You don't win MasterChef by sabotaging your opponent. You win MasterChef by cooking the better food. Survivor, on the other hand, is a show built around sabotage. There are skill-based competitions, but those competitions are not the thing that decides who goes home and who stays. The only thing that brings people home is the other people in the group voting them out regularly. Now, the Survivor model is, on its face, more interesting. Because I just basically described the whole show. It's really just about who's fucking over who and who else knows about it. But it's an interesting enough idea that it's fun to just watch these people play 4D chess with each other. But you can get away with the MasterChef model, even though it is intrinsically a little less interesting, as long as the thing that the contestants are doing is itself interesting to watch, like cooking food, or running an obstacle course, or blowing glass. The problem at the core of Too Hot to Handle is that its premise and its model don't match well together. The show opts for the MasterChef model, which is the one where the contestants themselves don't really have any power. The issue is, not having sex is not really very interesting to watch, the way cooking food is. What is interesting on the show is watching the different social dynamics between the players, but these dynamics don't really have any weight to them, because unlike Survivor, no one's voting anyone in or out. The producers decide who goes home and who wins. The contestants don't have any power over each other, and this is why Cam's threat was so laughably empty, it had to be, he can't do anything about if they have sex other than be unhappy with it. In addition to just making the show less interesting, another problem with this is that there isn't really a good failsafe if someone decides they no longer give a shit about winning. If someone stopped caring on MasterChef, they'd lose that round because they wouldn't be cooking good food. If someone stopped caring on Survivor, they'd be voted out by the group for not pulling their weight. But if someone stops giving a shit on Too Hot to Handle, there's kind of nothing that can be done. And that's what almost happened in season two, until the producers just figured they'd kick out that one girl before she fucked up the show too bad. And it's this, along with my previous comment about the contestants not deciding who wins, that brings me to my final, and I think, most interesting point in this video. Even with all this stuff going on, I think the most interesting thing about Too Hot to Handle is the lack of clarity as to how exactly the contestants are supposed to win. 
This was a big complaint I had about the first season, and I stand by it. Basically, the audience and the contestants alike had no idea how many people would win, how the cash prize would be split among them, and most importantly, how exactly you win the show. And I had thought that this would be a first season problem, that if the show made a second season, they'd get past this. But they don't, and in fact, they kind of take it to a whole new level. There is a card game typically known as Mao. Supposedly, the game is named after Chairman Mao, who was once boss of China. Under Mao's administration, apparently people would be routinely arrested for violating laws they did not even know existed. The laws were constantly changing and often contradictory with each other. I did not check whether this was actually how it was in Maoist China, but regardless of whether it's true or not, this is how the card game got its name. In Mao the game, the rules change round to round and game to game, and no one says them out loud. At first, only the person who wrote the rule knows the rule for that round, and other people learn the rule by noticing when that person tells people they've broken it. See, Too Hot to Handle, in my opinion, resembles Mao. It's not a perfect one-to-one -one analogy, of course, Mao is certainly more contradictory and more confusing, but they definitely share some connective tissue. There are some set rules in Too Hot to Handle, the main one being the sex ban, and this one is actually fairly straightforward, where we get into the Mao territory is with the eliminations. Four people are eliminated in the second season of Too Hot to Handle, and three of them are all eliminated for one reason, and that is they're going to fuck up the show if they don't kick them out. These are people who basically do not give a shit about winning or don't think they're going to win, and so the show can function, the producers have to kick them off the show. I talked about this flaw a little bit earlier. But the fourth contestant eliminated, Kayla, is a far more interesting, strange case. Kayla isn't screwing up the show by not playing along. She's screwing it up by playing along too well. She just doesn't break the rules. She doesn't flirt with anybody, and it seems like a good strategy until she gets eliminated for it. And it's her elimination that started to remind me first of Mao. See, because it's so unclear how you actually win on this show, the only thing either us or the contestants knows for sure is that they have to vibe on this island, they can't fuck, and eventually there's a cash prize. Kayla figures, correctly, that if she doesn't flirt with anybody, it'll be easier for her not to fuck anybody, and therefore it stands to reason, it seems, she'll be more likely to win the prize, right, if she doesn't break any of the rules. But when she's eliminated, we realize that this itself was a violation of the rules. You have to be tempted. You can't just opt out of flirting in general. You have to almost have sex. And neither Kayla nor us had any idea this would be a rule until she was eliminated for it. And that is the crux of Mao. You don't know a rule until you've broken it. This follows as well for the final episode of the season in which two things are revealed. One is that it's just one person who's going to be taking home the entire cash prize. We didn't know that until then. And two, that it's the other contestants who are voting on who's going to win out of three predetermined finalists. Now, if you're savvy, you might be catching a contradiction on my part right now. Wasn't I just complaining that the contestants didn't have any power over each other, and now they're deciding who wins, right? Well, that's true, and it certainly does make for an interesting final episode, but it doesn't really make up for all that time previously in the season when it at least seemed like they didn't have any power over each other, and for the purposes of the show being interesting, they may as well not have. But see, at its core, this is actually kind of brilliant. See, when you tell the contestants they're in the master chef model, that they don't have any power to decide who wins, the show gets less interesting, maybe, because they stop playing 4D chess, but it also gets more honest. No one is trying to make fake friends or get on anyone's good side just so they'll vote for them in the end. It's all a little bit more real. It's certainly more authentic than a show like Survivor, a show that's built on fake alliances and phony promises. What might have been nice is for the show to tell the audience that they're all going to be voting on the winner, even if they still didn't tell the contestants, because for us it would at least give us another thing to think about for the whole season, another dynamic. But regardless, this trick only works once. Too Hot to Handle is a famous show, and next season the contestants are going to know that it's at least a possibility they'll all be voting on the winner and the 40 chess is going to come back. All that authenticity is going to be lost, even if the gameplay might get a little bit more interesting. I dare say that Too Hot to Handle, while by no means any good, might be a little bit innovative. Someone can correct me if I'm wrong on this, but 
I have never heard of a reality show in which the contestants do not know the rules. And I think that's honestly pretty interesting. Now to keep this up, Too Hot to Handle is going to have to switch the rules every season, just as in Mao you have to switch the rules every game, or even every round, to prevent anyone from catching on too much. And honestly, I think that's an idea with a lot of potential. I don't think Too Hot to Handle will ever be a good show. The writers are too lazy, there are too many problems with it, and frankly the premise is already stale after two seasons. But I hope that doesn't mean that no other shows pursue this kind of structure. Because in the right hands, I do think that a reality show with a set of ever-changing, unclear rules could be really great if only it was executed way, way better than it was here. Let's be honest, reality television is getting a little bit boring. So maybe what the medium needs is more shows like Too Hot to Handle. More shows in which the contestants don't know a rule until they've broken it. More shows in which each new season basically signifies an entirely new game altogether. A Maoist revolution, if you will.